Perfect. Okay, so I take it that because you are at an escape room conference, that that means you are all fun people like me. Uh, so I'm going to start off with some fun with uh, hopefully this rotating thing here. This is here to hypnotize you. You are going to love my talk and you're going to come away from this, hopefully introducing some of this into your practice. That is my goal for the day. So I'm here to talk about improving the tutor tutee relationship and what we've done in uh, the chemistry department at the University of Surrey. My name is Nathaniel Bingham. Let's jump into it. There's not much of an introduction other than that. We'll just kind of float through the talk and see how it goes. So it started off because the chemistry department already had a pretty good relationship between tutors and tutees before I even arrived. Um, we have this open door policy at Surrey, and uh, that means that basically at any point, as long as you're in your office and not in a meeting, you have your door open and a uh, student can come along any point in time and ask you a question, whether that be academic or pastoral. We also have weekly personal tutor meetings, so that could be again pastoral or academic, um, but we meet up with our tutees regularly and also we have these mixed student staff events. I did almost dress up in my tuxedo because literally after this set of talks are done, I'm going to the Kemsock Ball tonight, which the academics are invited to as well. Uh, it's over there, I'm wearing the trousers, but I can put on the bow tie, it's too hot in here at the moment, so I can't do that. Um, but that lovely photo on the right hand side is from the Chemsock Review, which we do every Christmas time. Um, and it's staff and student events, there's singing, there's um, games. So that's them uh, two academics playing Chubby Bunny there. Um, and we have a staff sketch where we take the mick out of things that have happened in the year. Um, and it's just a great event. We already had that kind of relationship there. And we really think that it's important to build strong bonds between tutors and tutees um, because we're their first point of call. If anything goes wrong, they come to us straight away and they ask uh, whether that's for advice or whether it's to be directed around the university. We are their first point of call. So it's really important to build a strong bond and make us approachable to the students. When I came, I noticed that that relationship starts off a little bit slow um, because academic position of power, students very scared, um, big scary professor, sometimes not the most approachable. So I wanted to try and break down those barriers and that is where I thought an escape room might come in play. So I was doing a grad certificate, higher education, looking into gamification and playful learning and that's when I thought there's scope here for something new here. How about I make an escape room? We put it in into Welcome Week for our first year tutees um, and then that's the first point of call, uh, the first interaction with their tutor, do an escape room and see what happens. Uh, we thought it'd be a fun way to introduce them into the lab as well, get to know their tutor and force to interact. I am a big believer that if you go through pain with someone, then you build stronger bonds together. Now, I'm not saying my escape room is painful and very unpleasant, but what I am saying is that uh, I have experienced this myself, for example, with um, my father-in-law. We talked, but we weren't best buds. But then when we, uh, me and my wife moved into our flat together, we carried furniture up two flights of stairs. And after that, going through that pain and that trial, those challenges, it made us stronger and more talkative um, and it built on that relationship. And that's what I wanted to try and introduce here with the tutees and their tutors. Go through some challenges in the form of escape room and hopefully build a stronger relationship. So we're going to talk about the design of this just because the design in talks about some of these elements and how I implemented some of these kind of um, hopefully authentically building that relationship. So I'm chemist, so obviously it's going to be a runaway a reaction that's going to explode if you don't quench it within 45 minutes. That is the plan. We decided to have a parallel structure. The reason is we wanted everyone to interact with everyone. We thought if we did a linear structure for the uh, escape room, then it could lead to the stronger characters uh, leading most of the challenges and a couple of people potentially not even talking throughout the whole thing but we thought if we make it parallel then that way everyone can be their own uh, the main character in their own story and then come together and hopefully interact um, there. Uh, it's teams of two to six and that is just because of the tutor size and if students don't turn up on the day um, and we give them free hints, free hints. Um, because I start off the escape room. I am the one who plays a crazy scientist. Oh, I can't open a fume hood. I can't get to it. I can't quench the reaction. And I am stuck in that lab with them. And they've got to work out the puzzles whilst I'm wallowing in my own pity because I am the person who set up this reaction. But three hints because I want to set the group up for success. I want them to do well. I want them to win. So there's 
three hints in terms of yes there are three hints but if it's getting near at the end i will subtly go around and nudge them in the right direction because i want them to win i want to start off on the right foot but so let's go for the first thing like i said runaway reaction it's in the fume hood we can lock the fume hood so that it can't lift up this barrier um, and you need to get in there to quench the reaction so you need to find a key which is behind a lock box and that lock box is color based now um, that poses some inclusivity issues but we're going to talk about that later and don't worry we have Thought about those, but I would be interested in your thoughts on that as well as some outside perspectives, but we will talk about that later on. But in terms of the first puzzle, it requires academic input. We wanted this, it's the first time in the lab, lab since A-level, that the academics are required and uh, need to interact somehow. So we give them this TLC puzzle, and that is basically we give these white pieces of, of silica, it's sand, basically fancy sand on a piece of metal, and we hide it around um, the lab and we draw on it with a UV light only uh, detecting compound. So when we put it in this light box with UV light, suddenly numbers appear. So they won't know that. They won't know what these random pieces of card are with fancy sand on it, but the academic does. So they need to interact with the academic. Normally it's the student who comes up and says, what's this? And the academic will then tell them and teach them about that. Um, and then on the back, we put uh, numbers so that they can open a number lock with it. Puzzle two is a simple puzzle. It's just finding um, a, uh, a measuring cylinder that we have welded to the ground. We're not allowed to weld anything. So um, I asked them for a little bit of an imagination. We put a key in there with a piece of cork and then it gets to float up to the top. And again, this was important just because if someone's not on their best game for chemistry that day, everyone has bad days. Uh, it's been a while since they've been in exam and things. Uh, then they can still interact. There is a puzzle that doesn't involve much chemistry other than floating um, with some water. And again, that opens a lock with a color inside. Next one is mainly student focused. Um, so this one involves the student because academics haven't done titrations for a very long time. Um, I don't know if you've done A-level but um, or equivalent, but you probably would have been very scared of these things because you just do it over and over again. Um, they're everyone's worst nightmare, but they need to uh, get some uh, calculations and data from this. And that again opens a number lock, which on the inside has two chemicals, mix them together, and it gives you a color to open that final lock. And then the last one to talk about is, again, it's pre-university content. It's balancing an equation on the fume hood. That unlocks a, a piece of perspex, a giant piece of perspex with some boxes on, and then that allows it to go over the top of a periodic table, um, same size as that periodic table, and it spells out uh, another colour. So they're the puzzles. That's the, uh, the, the whole room, basically, in a nutshell. Please don't tell my students um, how to do these, uh, the puzzles. So, I said I was going to talk about the inclusivity aspects. Yes, there are colours involved at every step, but it's not just the visual colours. We have deliberately put in some uh, other ways to get to the colours. So, for example, uh, with a periodic table, it spells out orange. It's not actually the colour orange. For one of them, it is opening a box and there is a blue piece of card, but it says the word blue on it. Um, uh, the next one is the potential trickiest. We've got one bottle which says phenolphthalein on it and another which says sodium hydroxide. And from A level, it's very, very well known that when you mix the two together, that it turns bright pink. This is a very, very well known reaction. So again, it's drawing on their past knowledge and hopefully that is well known. And then the last one is a uh, sentence. I love the colour of chlorine. If I was ever going to program a lock, I would definitely include that colour. A little bit on the nose, but uh, the students haven't complained about it yet, which is good. And then, like I said, that then opens that final lock and we've got this colour to number um, uh, piece of paper that goes with it to help um, that. In terms of what happens, it needs buy-in from the academics. If the academics don't want to take part, it's never going to work. It's not going to happen. You need someone who uh, um, wants to take part. Luckily, the academics here, like we said, they're pretty good at getting involved with students and student activities. A lot of them are quite competitive. But I have found three different types of academics who take part in this. You get the leader. The leader is the person who just tells the students what to do and the students do it and then they come back and report to the academic and that is perfectly fine that helps because they all have to interact with the academic but it doesn't necessarily break down those barriers potentially as much but it's still very useful next is the team player uh, that's like me you get down and dirty and you are in there equal to everyone else that's ideally what i'd like everyone to be but unfortunately not everyone is like that and then you get the supervisor who just stands at the side and Um, so uh, the next thing is repeatability. We have three rooms at once. Um, there are three different rooms so that uh, every single year the academics can take part and it means that I only need to make minor tweaks every single year. 
Um, and the last thing was, how do I measure the improvement? Um, it turns out it's really hard and I can't, um, unfortunately. It comes down to talking to the other academics and trying to get their opinion. Um, and luckily they are very, very honest with me. They've given me good feedback. Uh, they all agreed that is a great icebreaker and um, a team working event. Uh, encourages that interaction with their tutee, but also between the tutees, which is also important. And they appreciate the importance of having those events. They also note that, and this is the them being brutally honest with me, that one event isn't going to revolutionize that relationship. It's one of those pie in the sky dreams. Unfortunately, you know, it's not going to, but it is a good foundation and they appreciated the starting point where I think we were lacking the most. And that they said that they needed follow up activities. And that is exactly what we've done for the future. There's high appreciation from both staff and students involved in this. Um, uh, everyone who takes part seems to love it other than those odd view academics. Uh, most tutors are happy to do this again and again. And the tutees want more events, which is hard for me because I've got a already very busy, but there we go. Um, oh, sorry, uh, what did I do? There we go. Uh, last slide, just to think in terms of what we've done next is I've taken some of that on board um, in terms of uh, what to do and build upon that. And that means that I've now introduced pub quizzes with tutors and tutees in their tutor groups. So they've got more in, uh, activities to interact between each other, icebreaker activity sessions, and also some game based revision sessions that they can take part in together. So more of these team based activities for them to take part in. So there we go. Thank you very much um, for listening to me ramble or talk at you for 15 minutes. Sorry, hopefully I didn't go over the time. Thank you to all these wonderful people who helped out in some way as well. It's a great team. This room wasn't purely designed by me. I needed great technicians to help with that. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. And yes, any questions? Nathan, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Lisa Alberici. You're all here for a lightning talk about virtual escape rooms, individual versus group participation. So I would like to talk through some of my work with virtual escape rooms at the University of Exeter. And if the structure and rhythm of that introduction feels familiar, it's because I've gone for the Inigo Montoya structure for quick introductions, uh, which essentially is a greeting, your name, a summary of the connection between you and the person or people that you're introducing yourself to, and set the tone and purpose of the account encounter. Um, so this is a, a, quick, a guide to quick introductions that I've utilised today. So as you can probably tell, I am all in with escape rooms in education. I think it's a fantastic um, way of interacting with our students. Um, I've been an educator for 20 years. I was an ancient historian originally. I'm now a senior lecturer in the School of Education at the University of Exeter. I'm a member of the Playful University Club, so this idea of bringing fun and interaction um, into learning. Um, during the lockdowns, I worked with some of our digital learning developers at the University of Exeter. So these were recent graduates um, who helped us with the shift to online teaching. Um, and I did some work with them on using social media and memes um, in education, um, hence Inigo Montoya. Um, I'm also um, active in the Active Learning Network. So this is for anyone who's interested in this kind of active, interactive way of, of um, learning and teaching um, our students. And it was, I think it was 2020, uh, when Jamie Hayward from Anglia Ruskin University um, shared his ideas for creating virtual escape rooms um, that were online so that they could be done um, during lockdown. Um, and this is something that um, I've picked up with my colleague Rachel Sloan at the University of Exeter. Rachel Sloan, also known as Scholar Lane for the purposes of escape rooms, she's the employability ski skills manager at the University of Exeter. And so right from the off, we were really interested in not just um, content acquisition, but also the skills development aspects um, of learning through escape rooms. So a quick note about the platform. 
I am so low tech and in awe of all the things that I've seen today. And I was at the showcase last year as well. So I know there's absolutely amazing things being created. And um, this was the idea that I got from Jamie, though, is to use Microsoft OneNote because it's part of the Microsoft Office suite um, at the University of Exeter. All staff and students are given access um, to the Microsoft Office suite. So we've all got access to OneNote. And if anyone remembers um, ring binder folders from the old days with the sort of um, uh, the dividers in between between the sections, it's essentially an a, a, a electronic version of one of those. And you can um, put a password on each of the sections. So my escape rooms are in Microsoft OneNote using um, puzzles, using um, kind of games to come up with a code word or a password that allows you just using the password function, the protection function, to get to the next stage um, in the escape room. I call them escape rooms, but like a lot of people today, mine are more like lockbox puzzles. So they're often looking for a key, those kind of narratives, but it's a similar sort of principles. Um, so this is the evolution then of, of my own engagement with um, escape rooms. Um, so working with um, Rachel, we were very in interested in students working together in groups and the fantastic way that you can get people working together very quickly and pulling together very quickly when they're um, doing a task together. And I think we've heard a lot about that um, today. So um, students working in groups, um, Rachel ran um, a, a very successful escape room on intercultural communication. So it was very much about how the students were interacting with each other, maybe challenging some of that communication, but that was very much a part of it. Now, one of my roles is the director of Exeter's academic professional program, which is the program that um, new lecturers or lecturers new to Exeter take when they first join the institution. And so I um, began designing escape rooms for educators to convince them that this might be something that they would think about in their own teaching. Um, so I've created a version for new lecturers. Um, I've created um, with Rachel an escape room in OneNote about creating escape rooms in OneNote. It's so meta. Um, so this is um, something that I've been um, particularly interested in to try and kind of share the wealth, share the message that this can be, um, you know, a, a fantastic tool. And it was while I was working with other educators that um, and I would do them online. So I would put people into breakout rooms and they would work together to solve the locked box puzzle or the escape room. Um, but it occurred to me that none of the intended learning outcomes for those sessions that I was running with educators was necessarily about the educators building their own teamwork or their own group work skills. So as a kind of nod to um, universal design for learning, uh, when I did these escape rooms with educators, I just gave people the option of whether they wanted to stay in the main room and work through them together alone or whether they wanted to join um, one of the breakout rooms and work together in a group to solve the, the puzzle, uh, to solve the escape room. And then last summer, Rachel and I worked with three student interns who we brought in. Um, we They went through our escape rooms about how to create escape rooms, and then they came up with their own ideas. Um, we had someone from geography, someone from mathematics and someone from um, Hispanic studies. So Spanish language they were um, interested in. Um, and one of the really interesting things about when we brought in the student interns is that two of them um, kind of automatically went to designing escape rooms that could be um, done by an individual. So because they're in OneNote, because they're online, it didn't necessarily rely upon um, cooperative or, or group learning, which I thought was particularly interesting. And that got me thinking, um, well, there are circumstances I know where I haven't sort of insisted that people have been in groups. How else might we, we be able to use this format then um, in order to be able to um, promote individual learning? So when I said um, individual versus um, groups, it's not actually versus. Um, essentially what it is, is I'm interested in um, uh, understanding um, 
in a very small scale at the moment, um, the efficacy of escape rooms for individual learning. So I've been awarded a very, very small discovery grant um, so that what I'm looking at and this, this is what I'm finding at the moment is an escape room in one note. So it's super rudimentary. It's not flash, um, but it's one that where the intended learning outcomes mean it can be completed individually or in a group. Um, and uh, at the end of that, I'm going to test um, learn the learning of content. So the um, the extent to which the individuals and the groups have met the intended learning outcomes of this um, experience. In addition, I'll also test um, through um, questionnaire and focus group how participants felt during the process. So actually, is there something extra that comes from the group work or actually is there a comfort that comes from um, learning individually sometimes when you know when it's appropriate then this has also been something that um, I've been particularly interested in in terms of inclusivity um, I think we heard earlier today that with um, real life escape rooms that sometimes um, some students with autism might take puzzles off by themselves and work through them and think this is absolutely brilliant and they're still contributing to the whole. Um, there's research that suggests some students or some people with ADHD find hooks and fun things a way of helping them to engage with their learning so that doesn't necessarily involve um, um, other people being in the mix but using this kind of style to engage with their learning. So essentially, how can an escape room structure and the sorts of principles we've been discussing today, because I am already sold and I think probably most of the people on the call here are sold, but how might they be used to support individual learning too? Um, and basically, that's the what I'd love to hear more about. That's what I'm um, particularly interested in. So thank you.